All right, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 47. The message today is called, What's Love Got to Do With It? Okay, uh, I know it, it's, it's not a song. Okay, I'm sure you guys are thinking about that. Uh, I, I'm not going to age myself, but I, I didn't grow up in the 80s, but more I'm a 90s kid. But if you recall the 80s, okay, ladies mainly, so uh, how many of you guys know what, remember Aquanet? Okay, all right, Aquanet, Jason, Jason, you know what Aquanet is? Okay, all right, right here. Okay, so Aquanet, right? Okay, so, you know, you have to, like, it was this can, right? You have to shake it. It was like, a, like spray paint almost, right? You got to spray that thing, and it's, like, not really good for the environment. Okay, and how many of you ladies had that hair that kind of went like this? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, all right. All right, so kids, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, look at your parents' old... Um, uh, photos, okay, and that can, can you can see that. And, or how many of you guys remember the blazer, right? The ladies had the blazer with the shoulder pads and the little ped, pendant. Okay, Oscar, you remember that? Okay, all right. April, Jason. <laughs> okay, Jason's shaking his head there. Okay, so this is the '80s, and and it's funny because I was coming up with this title, "What's Love Got to Do It?" And I typed it in, and guess who popped up? Tina Turner. Tina Turner popped up. And I actually watch a little clip of this video, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is, like, crazy. This is, like, back in, you know, back in the past here. So all jokes aside, so we've been talking about our interpersonal relationship series. This is actually week six of six. This is the last part of it. But if you guys recall, and when we study scripture, there are three things, right? Observation, interpretation, and application. So when we, when we open our Bibles, we want to observe the text. What is going on? Who is our audience? What is the culture? What is the policy? What is the politics? What is the geography? Who is Jesus talking to? The more you spend time observing the text, the more time it's easier for you to be able to interpret the text. So the ap after you observe the text, you interpret the text. What is you're dissecting the text? You know, you're comparing verses from others. Uh, does it align to the rest of the scripture? What is the theme of that, that verse? Does it align with scripture? Does it align with the book, uh, et cetera, et cetera? What does it say about God, and what does it say about man? Okay, last but not least, application. How do you apply what you've learned? What, well, how do you apply that in your everyday life? Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a working mom, whether you own your own business, right? Uh, you're out in the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. How do you apply that to your life? And these are very basic things on how we can stu study Scripture and how, can, how we can study Scripture better. So Jesus focuses on interpersonal relationships. Last, a few weeks back, we talked about murder and anger. We talked about lust, marriage and divorce, vows and promises. Last week, we talked about retaliation. And today, we're talking about loving our enemies. Okay, so the title is, What's Love Got to Do With It? So let's turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 47. Okay, but you have heard it, it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteousness and the unrighteousness. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, your own peeps is what he's saying, what are you doing more than the others? Don't, do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, so we're going to go into a little Greek today, okay? So if you recall in um, the Old Testament, Old Testament is written basically in Hebrew. That was the, the language of the Jewish people. And then there's a little part there in parts of Daniel and, and um, Ezekiel where it's Aramaic. It kind of changes a little bit. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's the Old Testament is written mainly in Hebrew. And then in the New Testament, you have Greek, okay? So what? why is Greek so significant? Okay, 
Greek language is so significant because it's so rich, okay? So if you recall the time of, uh, of Alexander the Great, right? He died at an early age. And then after that, you had the ruling powers of the Greeks, and then after that, it w- went to the Romans, okay? So you had the Greco-Roman era. And what's amazing about that is that Greek is actually a rich language. That was one of the benefits of this language. And we're going to do a little Greek. So in Greek, uh, in as opposed to, to English, the English language we use today, it's English doesn't really translate uh, clearly what the Greek says in the New Testament. It's not very clear. Now, it's, it's close, but it's not as, as, as the depth is not there. So we have to kind of study the languages a little bit. So in seminary, believe it or not, uh, part of all seminarians is that you have to take languages. And it's not languages like conversational languages that you and I have. Like let's say you take Spanish 101 or 102. You have conversations from the get-go. In seminary, it's more like uh, it's not linguistical language. It's, it's, it's academic languages. And it's a little different because the way they use Greek or Hebrew is not the way we they speak today. Does that make sense? So we have to kind of go into that a little bit. So there's this word that in Greek, uh, it's translated in English as love, all right? So remember, our title is, what's love got to do with it, right? Now, in, in the Greek language, there are three basic forms. These are just basic forms of love, okay? The first one is called phileo. Okay, what is phileo? Phileo is brotherly love. So this word c- derives from the city Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love, okay? So there's that aspect of love, and then there's another aspect, and it's called eros. Okay, what is eros? Kind of like erotic love, right? Okay, kids, if you guys don't know what that is, you can ask your parents, all right? have an interesting conversation, okay? And then there's, last but not least, there's agape love, A-G-A-P-E, okay? What is agape love? Agape love is unconditional love, okay? And that's the text that we are talking about today in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you you may be children of your Father in heaven. So this love that he's using is agape love. Okay, how do you know that? It's very hard from your English uh, Bible, but you have to go to the Greek. Okay, so it's agape. It's unconditional. Unconditional. That means it applies at every time, every place, every people. Does that make sense? So you can be in Africa. You can be... Asia, you can be in Europe, it still applies. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. It doesn't matter the year. It is unconditional. Okay? So let's go to the text again. So what, is it, what does this love mean? Let's kind of break up this, this, what is this agape love? All right? What does that mean? Agape love is to show love, to take pleasure in. The lexicon uses this and says it is to prize, to be content with, to be fond of doing. So what he's saying in context is, is that you need to love your enemies unconditional. You need to be, it's a forward type of love. Okay, in a marital relationship as well, right? We have to be, have unconditional forgiveness. Okay, Um, we need to know that you, we need to forgive our partner for whatever, you know, whatever the stir-up is last night or the night before. You need to come together and to show that you love each other despite, all right? So this love is a forward kind of love. It is an active love. It's not a passive love like we think love is. It's not love when we feel like we want to give this love only to those people that can give it back in return. That's not unconditional love. That's conditional love. But he's talking about unconditionally. Unconditionally so that those that cannot, can never repay that love back, those are the ones that Jesus is talking about. Remember, Jesus comes in and he is radicalizing what Christianity is. All right? Because the Pharisees, as thoughtful and scholar and so smart, they're like the brainiacs of the law. 
They were so smart of doing things that their heart, their heart fell apart. Their heart was not in it. They knew academically what was right, but their heart was so far off. So Jesus commands us all to love unconditionally those that cannot repay the love in return. He demands that we use every opportunity to love as Christ loved in return so that the gospel is made known and drawn and draw people to him. Your love and your action is not just to keep the peace. It's not just to keep the harmony. It's not just to keep the working relationships. You're going to see that person that's sitting in the next cubicle all the time. It's more than that. It's to bring glory to God. Your marriages, your relationships with your spouse, your relationship with your kids, that, is, that love is not just because you need to keep peace. It's more than that. It's to bring glory in how working relationships affect you and that other person, ultimately bringing glory to God. So my first point is God's desire, God's desire is for us to love the sinner and hate the sin. Does that make sense? We need to love, we need to love the sinner, the person who's acting in behalf if they have, if they've wronged you, but you have to differentiate that with the sin. We need to hate sin. God is a holy God. He does not stand, cannot stand what sin or evil or anything like that all right so god overshadows evil but at the same time he wants to overshadow you so that you could be redeemed and use your love to bring glory to him so love is the context of the jews all right so that's that's that this is what's happening love is the context of the jews the pharisees is to love those who love love them back but jesus is saying love those who cannot love you back that is the radical teaching. They actually use um, scripture, okay? They use the Bible, they use the Torah in Leviticus to ex- make excuse that they, they need to love those people that can love them back. That's what the Pharisees did. That's how far, far off they are. And bring, Jesus brings them back into reality what his original intentionality of love is. Leviticus 19.18 says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this is the text that they were using, saying, I'm only going to love, because this verse, remember this, this is what it says in the Bible, I'm only going to love those people that can love me back. Jesus is saying, no, you got this whole thing wrong. You got this whole thing wrong. So what I said about love, about this agape love, is that it is active, Okay, it's active. It's forward. It's not passive. It's not, well, I guess I got to love that person, you know, because I'm going to sleep right next to that person every night or I want some food, right? It's not that. It's an active love. It's you want to fall forward. You want to give everything to that attention to love that person because that's what God commands you. He's the creator of love, right? It's an active choice. Now, you are not responsible for the other person. Sometimes you, you want that, right? I want that. But you're not. You're responsible for you. You have the responsibility to be active and engaging in your love. Number two, love is as you go. As you go. That's another aspect of active. It's not when you feel like it. I'm going to love that person. Well, you know, everything's going well. Then, yeah, maybe I'll love that person in return. I'll forgive that person in return. No, it's as you go, even when you feel like you don't want to love the other person. See, that's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus commands. Do you think in the cross he's like, well, I kind of feel like forgiving these guys anyways, right? For they, they do not know what they're doing. He was in pain. He was in agony. Right? He was humiliated as the Romans whipped him and beat him. Right, And that's the way they did things. And, but he actively said, forgive them, for do, they do not know what they're doing. That's an active voice. All right, As you go, as you go about your way, not when you feel like it. Okay? And it's unconditional. We talked about that. It's unconditional. Right? Next thing is that Sorry, I lost my notes here. It's in the present tense, all right? 
So how many tenses do we have in English language? We have the past, present, future, right? So this one is in the present tense. But you know what's crazy about Greek? There's, there's more than three tenses. <laughs> they kind of throw it off, right? They kind of rewrote everything. So it's in the present tense now. You make peace. You love that person now, today, this minute, at 1133, right now. You love that person. You make amends to that person, even if they're not here. Okay? All right? And number last is that it is imperative. What does imperative mean? It's imperative, like let's say, Riley, I'm sorry, I'm going to use my son, you need to clean your room now, <laughs> all right? So if you read, if you listen to that, that means, is that, does that mean like when he feels like it? No, it's now. It's a command from his father, right? Because if he doesn't, he's not going to eat dinner. No, I'm just kidding, all right? So... <laughs> So it's imperative. It's a command by God. It's Again, it's not if you feel like it, it's not when, oh, when everything is going well or they make amends. No, it's now. It's a command by the Lord Jesus Christ for us to be peacemakers, to forgive actively even when they are not worth forgiving. Whew, that's hard. And some of you guys know this, right? You're probably looking, hey, Jackson, you're only like half my age. You don't even know what forgiveness is. You're right. I don't. All right, but Jesus does. <laughs> Jesus does. I'm spe- I'm speaking just I'm an orator. I am a speaker for him. All right? So don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> right? Don't be throwing tomatoes at me. Jesus says you need to love actively as you go right now present. And I'm commanding you to love that person now. So you want to turn your Bibles. We're going to go through about 13 chapters of Genesis in about 10 minutes. You guys ready? All right. Okay. Genesis 37. Genesis 37. It's not up on the screen because there's just no way we could do this. All right. And we're going to end in Genesis 50. Okay. And I'm going to recap. I'm going to paraphrase. Okay. So what I'm saying is, is just kind of summarize paraphrase version. And if you disagree or you feel like, well, well, you go ahead and read, read scripture. Okay. So uh, we can't, there's no way we can congest 13 chapters in 10 minutes. All right, Genesis uh, chapter 37, you know the life of Joseph, right? Wonderful story, wonderful story. You can't make this up. You thought you've seen everything? Guess what? The Bible has it before you. Okay, Genesis 37, Joseph, right? He's the son of Israel, Jacob, right? And he had his brothers, and what, what do we know about Joseph? His brothers hated him, right? Remember that? His brothers hated him. And what made it worse is his da- that's his daddy's favorite. You're not supposed to have favorites in your kids, right? But he did, okay? And he bought him a colored tunic. Remember we talked about this last year? Uh, last year, sorry. <laughs> last week, okay? So Joseph had this bit, and, and uh, moreover, he, had, he was into dreams. He can interpret dreams. He even said to his brothers, you know what? I know you guys don't like me. I know that, okay? And, and they, they weren't going to show, they were going to show it too. But I had dreamt that you, you brothers were bowing to me. Now, did that appease that situation a little bit more? No, right? It made them furious, furious enough that they conspired to what? To kill him. That's right. So if you forward, we're going to skip Genesis uh, 38. There's a reason why. So we're going to skip that. Some of you guys know what that story is. We're going to go to Genesis 39. Joseph is then sold as a slave in Egypt, right? He was sold as a slave. You guys know this, okay? And, 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 and what's great is, is that when, with Joseph, he's, he is handsome in appearance. See, that's what happens when you walk with the Lord, all right? You become handsome, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So he, he gets sold as a slave in Egypt, right? He was very handsome in appearance. If you think I'm lying, look at Genesis 39, okay? And then he becomes a, a housekeeper, right? To who? To Mr. McPotiphar, right? Mr. McPotiphar's housekeeper, right? And then whatever he does, he succeeds. And whatever he does, he succeeds in, in the home. Because it's not because of him. It's not because of his great looks. It's because of God in him, in Joseph, Right? So Mr. McPotiphar, there was a problem at his house. Guess what was happening? Mrs. McPotiphar started hitting on him, right? 
Okay? You can't make this up. This is in the Bible, y'all. Okay? Start hitting on him. Not just one time. Every day. The Bible says every single day. Every single day. All right? And then later on, what happens? He gets blamed, right? Because she said he, you know, he said he wanted to do this, whatever, right? So he gets blamed and he gets sent to the prison. Okay, Genesis 40. Joseph goes to jail, right? But what happens is because God is in him. God is in him. He didn't deserve this, right? There was extreme injustice there. But he prospered even in the jail, even in the darkest times of his life. He prospered. Why? Because God was with him. So now Pharaoh had bakers and cup, cup holders or cup bearers, right? And they ended up going to jail for whatever they did. I don't even understand. All right? So they had a dream, and then Joseph w- does what? He interprets dreams. So he interprets. He says, you know, cup bearer, I'm sorry, man. You're out. You're going to be out. Okay? Uh, and then to, to the baker, he says, remember me. All right? Genesis 41 Pharaoh, fast forward several years, seven years, Pharaoh has had a bad dream. Okay, remember, they're in Egypt, and he needed someone to interpret his dream, but no one could. His magicians and everyone else couldn't interpret his dream. So he dreamt of these seven, uh, the seven cows, seven skinny and fat, right? And the magician, magicians couldn't interpret, but the cupbearer remembered Joseph. Right? Did I get the right person, cupbearer? Yeah. Remembered, the baker's the one that died, the cupbearer's the one that lived. The cupbearer remembered Joseph and says, hey, you know what, Mr. Pharaoh, there's a guy, remember when you threw me in the slammer? There's a guy that I knew, that I met, that could interpret dreams. Really? Yes, bring him over. So he interprets the, this young Hebrew youth, gets out of jail, right? And then Joseph uh, says, it is not I that can interpret, but God that will, will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So what happens? Joseph interprets it, right? He gets promoted. He becomes the manager of FEMA in Egypt, all right? He's the director of emergency management, okay? Then he saves Egypt by providing and saving grain. So there's this big famine that happened in that area in the Middle East where his brothers, his father uh, uh, Israel says to his brothers who sold him to slavery, he said, guess what? I want you guys to go to Egypt because I heard they got some good food over there. They still got some food, all right? You need to go there and get some grub, right? So he goes and sends them there. And then if you, in recorded in Genesis 42 to 46, right, you see how, G, uh, how Joseph gets to encounter his brothers, right? He, by their language and all that stuff, all those things happen. And then Joseph in, in Genesis 45 deals kindly with his brothers, right? Because of of the the relationship with the father. So fast forward to Genesis 50, which is what we have on the screen. When Joseph's brothers, this is where it comes to the head. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, uh uh-oh, at least their daddy was protecting them, right? Now daddy ain't there anymore, okay? And they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays back in full for all the wrong things we did to him? So they sent a message, right, like a text message, right, or Snapchat or something like that, Facebook, to Joseph, because they they didn't want to confront him. They sent him a message, okay, all right, saying, your father charged before he died, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sins, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive this transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph, this is his response, Joseph wept. If I was in that situation, I would have done something very different. Joseph wept when he spoke to him. Verse 18, then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to him, because God was with him, Do not be afraid, for I, for I, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant evil it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people's lives verse 21 so therefore do not be afraid i will provide for you your little ones so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them you can't make this up that is ultimate agape love his their brothers deserved it if i was put in that situation i probably did something very very different from joseph right 
And I'm sure you will too, or maybe it's just me. <laughs> but you see, they didn't deserve it. They were in no position to deserve it. But he, because of God, because God has been faithful to him, shared that forgiveness to his brothers. Amazing. So it doesn't stop there. Luke 23, verse 33. Turn your Bibles to Luke 23. I know I, I'm having you turn your Bibles. There's a reason for that, because we need to be entrenched with God's word. You need to know where these books are. And moreover, you can buy tabs for your Bible. You can actually read the table of contents, okay? I don't have time to walk you through every single thing. You are a student of God's word. You need to open your Bible and read, okay? So Luke 23, verse 33, right? Jesus is in the business of love and forgiveness, that he goes above and beyond to send his son for you and me as an example of his love and forgiveness. While hanging on the cross at Calvary, Jesus said in verse 33, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, on one on his right and one on his left. But Jesus saying, was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looked on, and even the rulers were snaring at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he's the Christ, the king, his chosen one. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the, the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there also is an inscription above him, which says, This is the king of the Jews. That is to mock him. One of the criminals who were hanging there hurled abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other on the side rebuked him and says, do you, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, this man had nothing wrong. And he was saying, and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Jesus is the ultimate example of how to forgive. While on the cross, not when he felt like it, not when that person is deserving, because remember, they were both criminals, right? To his left and right. But there's a remorse of sin. There's a remorse of needing a savior. See, Jesus uses you to be that bridge, to be that bridge and conduit so that they can know forgiveness. And they can know forgiveness so that they can know Jesus Christ one day. And they're not going to look at you when everything, they're not going to look at your testimony and when everything is going right in your life. It's when those things are falling apart, things in the, in the house, things in the business. It's not, we're on the red all the time. That's, what, that's when they are looking at you and your example and your testimony for the Lord Jesus. Now that we know what love is, let's go in to how do we love, right? So we know what, what it is. Let's go to how do we do this number two my second point is lo god's love is sacrificial god's love is sacrificial right he takes it to another level he's not just going to give you a road map right to say oh, this is how you need to live your life no i'm going to walk with you and guess what when you walk with me there's going to be a cost when you forgive there's always a cost Okay, churches, we don't talk about this cost as much. We think that it's all fun and bubbly, but it's not. It's hard. It is hard. Jesus says there is a cost of love. The cost is so high, yet the reward is great. The cost is that you might lose financial gain. You might lose friends. You might even lose a date for you some single people, right? You might, you might lose some relationships. The object of laughter you might be pressured into doing certain things. You might be ridiculed, but it is worth it because you are honoring and glorifying your life and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so worth it, All right? The Bible says we need to take up our cross daily and follow him every day, not when it's not just Sundays, y'all, not when things are hard and difficult, not when you want something. 
You need to pick up your cross daily so that you can actively be participant to be able to be a conduit for agape, for unconditional love. All right? So let's look at Luke 15. Luke, Luke 15, chapter 1, verse, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 15, verse 1 and verse 7. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen. Because remember, these are the, his audience. Remember I said, you got to know your audience. And th- he was giving it to them, right? Now th- all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming to him, not, not just a few, all, to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Right? So, because they were so good, the Pharisees were so good and so right and so righteous, right? So proper. But Jesus comes and breaks that right away. He has dinner with these sinners, the ones that are uh, marginalized because of their past or their current situation. He goes after them. So he told them this parable, saying in verse 4 What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them? does not leave the 99 in the open pastures and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? That doesn't make mathematical sense for me. I have 99 sheep, right? And one goes, I'm like, hey, I got 99 more, see ya, right? But he goes and leaves the 99, and he goes actively, right? Actively, as you go, presently, imperatively, he goes to them, right? He goes to that lost sheep, right? What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine, the open pastures, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders. That is significant. He lays it on his shoulder. What is that? It's not a shame thing that, hey, you strayed away, and I'm going to badmouth you and embarrass you to everybody else. No, he picks it up, and he puts it on his shoulders. Right? What God could do that? That's amazing. He puts in his shoulder and rejoices. I'll be, I'll be putting on my shoulder. I'll be like, man, if you do this again, this is it. You know, right? And when he comes home, he calls together his friends, his peeps, his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I tell you in the same way that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous person who needs no repentance. Let me ask you guys this. Are you righteous? Are you so righteous that you forget the sin, the depravity of you, of what you've caused in the Lord? Did you forget that? You're so righteous. God is not about righteous. He comes after the sinners. He comes to those that are weak. He comes to those that are ill. He saves those people. Does God love everybody? Absolutely. Does God atone for everyone's sin? Absolutely. Absolutely. But he rejoices over those that recognize that their condition, they are bankrupt, they've fallen short by not forgiving, but my, by not making amends to someone that they needed to do. So I'm going to give you a homework right now. You have your Bibles, right? Okay? If you don't have your Bibles, if you have your phone, there's a little function called notes. Okay? Use it. All right? Write three people that you know off the top of your head that you need to show forgiveness actively as you go presently imperatively who are those people write it right now again if you don't have your bible use your phone your notes write it write those and pray for that person and pray that god would give you the courage to forgive that person to have that conversation with that person i have some of those too i have i have them in my my bibles right here i'll show you okay and guess what? Those, it might be people that are very, very close to you. Amen? Right? It might be especially those people. It might be a p- person right next to you. I don't know. It might be a person right that you deal with every day on a daily basis that you need to actively ask and make amends and forgive that person and see what the Lord does because that's when, when you honor God, he honors you. Right? Okay, I have eight minutes. Recent headlines. I know you guys watching the news, all right? Or you guys do not watch news here in Waller County. I'm sure you watch news somehow, okay? Former Dallas police officer Amber Geyer, you guys know this, this is making headlines, was sentenced on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, to serve 10 year sentence in prison 
for fatally killing in 2018 an innocent man she shot when she mistakenly entered his apartment, believing that it was her own, right? But in a remarkable act of kindness, the brother of the victim took the witness stand and spoke directly at Geyer, saying, I love you like anyone else, and later hugged her in the courtroom before she was led off to prison. Okay, you guys, you guys saw this, right? Okay. The sentencing, so, so what happens is in the court system is that there is the guilty, right? The guilty um, uh, uh, conviction. And after that, there's the sentencing. And this is where it was happening. The sentence appeared to initially, because of the 10 years sentence, the sentence appeared to initially disappoint the family of the victim, Mr. Gene's family, who had hoped for a harsher punishment for the then officer, uh, Geyer, Several members of the family broke down in tears, shaking their heads as in disbelief of the jury's decision. Okay? But Gene's 18-year-old brother, Brant Gene, took the witness stand and spoke to Geyer, saying, I know if you go to God and ask for him, he will forgive you. I think we have a picture of that. Guys, right? Remember this? If you, this is what he's saying to Officer Geyer. I love you just like anyone else, and I'm not going to hope you rot and die, Brant said. I personally want the best for you. I wasn't going to say this in front of my family, because his family would be really na na nasty to him. I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you, because I know that's exactly what Botham, his brother who died, wants for you. Give your life to Christ. I think giving your life to Christ is the best thing Botham would want for you. So he then requests the judge, Judge Kemp, if he can approach and hug her. And it's, it's viral today. You guys know this, right? Kemp, uh, who is the, the judge, presiding judge, after 30 years said, in my 30 years experience, I've never seen this at all. That is unconditional love. Someone that has taken away a loved one in your life, one that you care for, but you actively, as you go, presently, imperatively go and make amends to forgive that person. You know who's the leader of that family? Is this 18-year-old kid who didn't know much. He was nervous. If you saw this clip on YouTube or whatever, I encourage you to watch it. Shaking, knowing that there are repercussions from his family right? There's anger in the community, but he goes and uses and becomes a vessel for Christ to make amends on something that was outright wrong to make it right. That is true love. It doesn't end there. It's the beginning for you guys. Those three names or names that you wrote on your Bible, you have the opportunity to do the same thing. Now, it's not going to be on YouTube. It's not going to be on, on the news uh, television, but it's between you and God and that person. Make it right. Jesus wants lives to be restored. Jesus wants forgiveness because he ultimately forgave you and me. Don't, don't forget that. That's the only reason why we're here today. That's the only reason why I'm here today is because of, the, of God's faithfulness and forgiveness in my sins. Amen? So pray. Pray for those people. Pray for healing. Pray that you have the opportunity to make it right with that person as well. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you and we say thank you so much. Your love is abundant. Your love is filling. Your love is never ending. Your mercy and grace restores lives. Your love and grace restores us so that we can know you and have a deeper relationship with you, not just this elementary know-it-all love. You're wanting us to have unconditional love. Unconditional love. Lord, forgive us for when we failed. Forgive us when, when we do not want to show forgiveness. I, I am there myself, Lord. And you know those people in my life, in my family, that it's very difficult for me to do so. So, Lord, I ask, Father, 
Help me to be an example to my church, to my brothers and sisters in the Lord to forgive because that's what you've done for me. And Lord, I pray that we would be active in doing this in everyday life. It might be someone very close. It might be someone maybe we've seen once in a while. Maybe someone we've seen only in holidays or Christmas gatherings or family gatherings. But Lord, help us to make active, the active choice of loving and restoring by the grace of your forgiveness that you've offered to us. Lord, we are not responsible for their actions. We're not responsible if they accept the forgiveness. But we're responsible for us. And we have control of us. So we ask, Father, that you be with us today. Give us courage to do your command to restore, to forgive, and to love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You have an opportunity to respond. Uh, You have an opportunity to respond today to be able to lay it before the Lord on those people in your life. Because I know you have them. (laughs) I have them. Who is it that you need restoration with? Who is it that you need to forgive? Who is it that may have taken so much of your energy and your time and your sleep? Because if this person's this person had wronged you, this is the time for you to respond to be able to lay it before Christ's feet. It's hard.